God cares about that, then Rahab shouldn't be in the genealogy of Jesus Christ because Rahab was a prostitute. Every man in town have slept with her. Every man in town knew her nakedness. But when he had an encounter with Jehovah, when he had an encounter with El Elyon, God never talked about her past. God never looked about her past. You check the genealogy of the Savior of the world. You check the genealogy of Emmanuel. You check the genealogy of the Messiah. You check the genealogy of the King of Kings. You will see Rahab, the prostitute, right there. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at somebody and tell the person, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. I want to teach on a subject I've entitled The Last Days Army. Look at somebody and say, The Last Days Army. Or look at the other person and tell the person, The Last Days Army. Please, you may be seated in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the entrance of your word will bring light and illumination and it will bring understanding to the simple father i pray in jesus name let me not speak your word let me not speak my word let me speak only your word anything that i have planned to speak let me not speak it anything that i desire to speak let me not speak it Use me as an instrument, a vessel, a conduit, Father, to speak and to declare your counsel necessary for this morning. And let your word pierce through every heart and permeate through every spirit. And Father, let everyone under the sound of my voice live blessed beyond measure in Jesus' name. Amen. For the last time, somebody say, the last day's army. Or oh, say it like you mean it, the last day's army. If you don't say it well, you will not be part. Somebody say, the last day's army. You are not talking like a soldier. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible calls us soldiers. Somebody say, the last day's army. Oh, say it again, the last day's army. army. Hallelujah. And so like I've been teaching for the past uh, three days uh, concerning this end time army, this last day's army, and how God is going to use them and, and how God is going to use them to bring a revolution, to bring order, to bring structure in the church and they will shake the kingdom of darkness, silence the activities and the works of the enemy. Now, today I want to take it to another level. I want you to turn your Bible to Luke chapter 22, the verse number 11. I want you to give it to me in the NIV. Luke chapter 22, the verse number 11. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. I will read it again. But when someone, but when someone stronger attacks, and overpowers him. He takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoil. I want you to understand under the sound of my voice that the last day's army, this end time army, that God is raising, first and foremost, they are not natural army. They are supernatural army. Now, if they are supernatural army, then it means that they don't depend on the arm of the flesh. Secondly, they don't operate in the flesh. They don't operate 
in the natural. They operate in the supernatural. Now, if it is a supernatural army, it also means that they are not dependent on the flesh. They are absolutely dependent on the spirit and also of the supernatural. And I want you to understand that this last day's army, they cannot be stopped by denominational barriers. They cannot also be stopped by racial prejudice because they are focused on their assignment. They are focused on the divine agenda and plan of God that there is absolutely nothing that can deviate or divert their focus on their agenda and, and, and on their mandate. I want you also to understand that this last day's army, I call them the Satan strippers. Somebody say Satan strippers. The reason why I call them the Satan strippers is because of the scripture that we just read. The Bible says that when a stronger man, but when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the ammo in which the man trusted and divides up the spoil. Which means that for anybody to overpower the strong man, the person must be stronger than the strong man. Which means that the last day's army, they are stronger than the strong man. And the reason why they are able to strip the strong man because they are more powerful than the strong man now you look at the scripture that we read the bible says that if the stronger person overpowered the strong man the stronger person strips the strong man of what his armor strips him of his armor in other words what the bible is telling us is this that the last day's army they will strip the enemy of everything that he possesses they will strip the enemy of his power they will strip the enemy of anything that he relies on and depends on because they are much stronger than the strong man and then I want you also to understand that the last day's army, they would disarm the enemy because they are better armed. Because you cannot disarm the enemy if you are not better armed than the enemy. So the last day's army, they are well equipped, well endowed. They are fully loaded with all the weaponry that they need. In their arsenals. They are powerful. They have been given delegated power and delegated authority. And so nothing scares them, nothing intimidates them, and nothing pushes them away. Rather, they confront the enemy and the works of the enemy and the activities of the enemy, and they are able to silence the enemy and all his activities. Having said that, I want you to understand that this last day's army is built after the pattern of David. Somebody say, after the pattern of David. Somebody say, after the pattern of David. In other words, they function and they operate like David. You see, most of us, we just know David as a king. We also know him as a majestic worshiper. But David also is a mighty warrior. He is also a soldier and he is also military strategist. And so the reason why this last day's army is built after the pattern of David is because this last day's army in the spirit realm and in the supernatural realm, they are kings. Why are they kings? They are kings to rule over their jurisdiction. They are kings to rule over their domain. They are kings who have been given authority and power to stop every works and every activity and every agenda of the enemy. Not only that, they are also great worshippers. You see, the times that we are in, we are looking, God is looking for great worshippers. 
those who worship God without any sentiment attached to it, those who worship God, not because they want anything from him. Those who worship God, not because of their predicament and their present situation and circumstances, but they come to the presence of God and they worship him because of who he is. They don't even worship him because of what he has done for them, but they worship him because of who he is. Who is he? He is the creator of the heavens and of the earth. Who is he? He is the unchangeable changer. Who is he? He is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repay. Who is he? The ancient of days. Who is he? The rose of Sharon. Who is he? The lily of the valley. Who is he? The I am that I am. Who is he? The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Who is he? He is the God that shares not his glory with anybody. Who is he? He is the God that answered prayer and he is the God that hears prayers. Who is he? He is the consuming fire. He is the omnipotent God. He is the mighty man of war. That is why when we come into his presence to worship him, we don't worship him only for the things that he has done for us, but we worship him because of who he is. Because there is no God like him. And there will never be any God like him. Beside him, there is none. Behind him, there is none. In front of him, there is none. And so, this last day's army, they are army that knows how to worship God. They stay in the presence of God. They give him all their adoration. They exalt his name. They magnify his name. They extol him like they have never done before. They are people that knows how to be lost in worship. They are people who don't look at other people before they worship. They are people who don't worship because of instruments. When they come to the presence of God, they don't care whether there is instrument or no instrument. They don't care whether there is choir or no choir because they know where they have come from and how far God has brought them. When they come to the presence of God, they magnify his name. They exalt his name. They enthrone him. They are great worshipers. They worship God at all times. They magnify his name at all times. And oftentimes, when they come to his presence, they are lost in his presence. They are not looking at their time. They are not looking at when is this worship going to end. Because all they want is him. That is all that they want. Him. David was a great worshiper. The Bible makes us to understand that seven times in a day, he will come to the presence of God and worship him. I want you to just visualize that. I want you to just imagine that seven times in a day. Even if it is an hour each time he comes to the presence of God, that is seven hours each and every day, David comes to the presence of God and worship him. Let me tell you, the key to triumph, the key to your victory, the key for you to prevail is to come to the place of worship. We must learn how to worship him. We must learn how to throw our hands in abandonment in worship. We must learn how to come to his presence and say to him that God, whatever I have, whoever I am, is but for your grace. Is but for your grace. And this kind of worship, like I said earlier on, you don't worship him because of what he has done. You come to his presence and you say, God, even though I ask you for that thing and you have not answered yet, but still, I love you. God, even though I am in a tight place and I'm in a precarious situation and I'm in in a difficult place and complex place, God, I still love you. When I said you should deliver me, you didn't deliver me. You made me stay and go through the storm. But I still love you. 
worship without any attachment worship without any ulterior motive you are not worshiping him to manipulate him you are not worshiping because you want him to do something for you you are worshiping him because he is the king of kings and the lord of lords and so the last day's army is an army that knows how to worship somebody say worship you see most of us we only worship when we come to church most of us we only worship when we are in group but beloved you must learn how to worship on your own at the house worship him in the kitchen worship him in the car worship him in the bedroom worship him lie down prostrate before him kneel before him stand before him lift up your hands and worship him and one of the things that i've come to realize by experiential knowledge as you worship god the things that you desire that you have not even yet asked him he begins to do it because what happens is this when you worship god you make him swell because worshiping is bragging on god worship is telling god that i have seen other gods but there is none like you i have talked to other gods but i realize that the other gods they have years but they cannot hear they have mouth but they cannot speak they have eyes but they cannot see but anytime i come to you my god anytime i come to you jehovah anytime i come to you elohim anytime i come to you king of kings before i open my mouth you know my request before i petition you you have already answered who is like unto our god among the gods for you are glorious in holiness and you are fearful in praises you see anytime you worship god like that god comes to you and says son even though you have not asked me anything what do you want what do you want what do you desire for me to do for you which door do you want me to open which gate do you want me to open do you need divine intervention do you need prosperity do you need healing do you need favor do you need elevation do you need promotion what do you desire of me i will do anything for you why because of your worship because of your worship you don't need to have a voice to worship him because your worship has got nothing to do with your voice worship is not of the lips worship is of the heart worship is not of the flesh worship is of the spirit that is why jesus said those who worship him will worship him in truth and in spirit because when it comes to true worship it got to be in the spirit it cannot be in the flesh why because when you stand before him all you see is him him and him alone nothing else matters when you come to church like this and you are worshiping you don't care about the person that is standing beside you or, or the person that is sitting beside you your focus is on him and him alone i am talking about the last day's army that knows how to worship the Bible says that when God made the children of the Israelites cross the Red Sea, when they cross the Red Sea, let me tell you, the children of the Israelites, they know how to move the heart of God. The Bible says that the prophetess Miriam took a timbrel 
And the Bible says that she led the congregation in worship. In worship. In adoration. They magnify his name. They said, God, we have seen your wondrous works, but we have never seen this one before. You are greater than the greatest. You are bigger than the biggest. You are taller than the tallest. You are almighty. You are sovereign. Your supremacy is for eternity. Your reign is for eternity. You are the God that never grows old. And you are the God that never grows younger. You always remain the same. No wonder the Bible says that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. The last days army, they know how to worship God. Even in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of storm, they know how to lift up their hands and say, Father, I worship you. Father, I thank you. Father, you have been good to me. Father, I don't deserve your favor and your grace, but yet you always show me your grace and your favor. I have come to you to say, what shall I render unto you? The last days, I mean, they know how to worship God. Another thing that they know how to do, according to the pattern of David, is that they know how to war. They know how to battle. They know how to enter into warfare. David never lost even a single battle. There is nowhere in scripture where the Bible says that and David went into battle and he lost. Never lost in a battle. Because you see, when you know how to worship, you can't lose in a battle. When you know how to come to his presence, when you know how to invoke his presence, when you know how to stay in his presence, when you know how to lie down in his presence, when you know how to kneel in his presence, you can never lose in a battle. They will conspire. They will formulate. They will desire. They will project. They will come together to do anything and everything to keep you down. But because of your worship. Your worship brings you to the place of empowerment. Your worship brings you to the place of authority. Your worship brings you to the place where you are armed. Dangerously armed. That when you enter into the battle, you prevail at all costs. At all costs, you prevail. David never lost any battle. Every battle that he enters into, he prevails. Why? Because he was a military strategist. A military strategist. You see, when you know how to come to his presence in worship, God gives you instructions. God gives you directions. He gives you guidance. He exposes the enemy to you. The weaknesses and the strength of the enemy. He tells you what the enemy is planning. He unravel and unfold the things that the enemy has orchestrated against you. Ten years to come. Five years to come. A week to come. A month to come. That is why it is highly imperative that we always come to his presence. And the reason why David never lost any battle is because any time he comes to the presence of God, God gives him the strategy. The strategy for the battle. The strategy for the warfare. That is why in all his battles, he prevailed. And I want you to understand that this last day's army, they will not take instruction from any man. They will not take instruction because they are intellectually competent. They will not take instruction because they are well educated. They will not take instruction from anybody because they have the ability to comprehend and apprehend. Their dependability and reliability is on God and God alone. If God doesn't speak, they don't move. If God doesn't give the directives, they are not moving an inch. They are absolutely dependent. 
dependent on God and God alone. The reason why some of you, you have lost so many battles is because you have depended on the arm of the flesh. But the last days army, like I said earlier on, they are not dependent on the natural. They are not dependent on the arm of the flesh. They are absolutely reliant on the spirit. They are absolutely depending on God to direct and to guide them and to lead them. Let me tell you, if you would depend on God, there is no battle that you are going to lose. You can't lose any battle. And you know, you don't need so many people to stand with you to prevail. You don't need so many people to go into the battle with you. If only you know how to worship, if you know how to listen to him, he will guide you, he will direct you. When you go into the battle all by yourself, you can defeat them. Because you are not there all by yourself. The host of heaven is with you. God is with you. You are not there by yourself. No wonder David had a resounding victory, triumph over Goliath. Because he didn't face Goliath by the arm of the flesh. King Saul, King Saul tried to equip him with gadgets. Queen Saul tried to equip him with his armor. He put on the armor, he couldn't move. Because when you depend on the flesh, you will not be able to move. Why? Because the flesh and the natural will weigh you down. So he put it on, but he couldn't handle it. And he looked at King Saul and told Saul, King Saul, that this one, I can't handle it. Get your armor. I am not going to face Goliath in the arm of the flesh. Because if this weaponry and if this armor could help you, you wouldn't have given it to me. You would have faced Goliath yourself. But you know that this armor and this weaponry cannot help you. And if it cannot help you, it cannot help me. You are depending on the flesh and you are depending on the natural. But I am depending on the supernatural. I don't operate in the flesh. I operate in the spirit. Spirit. I don't operate in the earthly realm. I operate in the heavenly realm. And my chief commander is not you. My chief commander is God. That is why when David faced Goliath, he told Goliath, you come to me with spears. You come to me with shield and sword. But I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. In other words, I am not standing here by myself. You have looked at me and you have underestimated me. You look at me and say, who is this small boy who, who is taking uh, 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 five stones to kill me? Am I a dog? But Goliath didn't know that he wasn't dealing with David. He was dealing with God. God was just using David as a conduit to destroy Goliath. You see, when you know how to depend on him, when you know how to rely on him, when you know how to seek him, when you know how to receive directives and guidance and direction from him, if you know how to listen to him, he will use you as a conduit. He will use you as a vessel. He will use you as an instrument. And so when you speak, it is not your voice that is speaking, but it is his voice that is speaking. When you decree, it is not you that is decreeing. It is the Lord that is decreeing. When you declare, it is not you that is declaring. It is the Lord that is declaring. When you proclaim, it is not you that is proclaiming. It is God that is proclaiming. And so when David stood there and Goliath underestimated and undervalued him, he didn't know that he was underestimating God and he was undervaluing God. And so God said to Goliath, I will kill you. I will kill you today. I will behead you with your own sword. I will give your carcasses to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the earth. Now you got to understand that David didn't use his own sword to behead Goliath. He uses Goliath's sword to behead him. What Satan has orchestrated to use to kill you, it is the same thing that is going to kill them. What Satan has orchestrated to put you down, God is going to use the same thing to put them down. What Satan has planned to drown you, God 
God is going to use the same thing to drown them. What Satan has decided and orchestrated and formulated and put together to bring you shame and disgrace and reproach, God is going to use the same thing to bring shame and disgrace and reproach. And the Bible says that and Haman prepared a gallows to hang the entire Jewish race. But the gallows that he prepared to kill the Jews, it was the same gallows that killed him. I don't know who I came to talk to and I don't know who I came to speak to, but I came to declare to somebody, whatever the enemy has planned, whatever the enemy has orchestrated, whatever the conspiracy is, whatever the arrows are, I declare over you that they will not prevail. Uh, they will not prevail. Judgment will come upon them. The wrath of God will consume them. The anger of God will seize upon them. If you believe it, shout fire. fire. The last day, son. They are built according to the pattern of David. And if they are built according to the pattern of David, then it means that they know that they have weaknesses. They have weaknesses. And then it means that they know that they are just but humans. Uh, David, as mighty as he was, he was a king. And like I said, he was a majestic worshiper, but yet he had flaws. Your flaws doesn't disqualify you from being part of the last days. Amen. Your past doesn't disqualify you from being part of the last days. Amen. The things you have done in the past doesn't negate you from being enlisted into the end time army. Why am I saying that? If your past will interfere with your future, then Moses is not supposed to be the deliverer and the prophet of the children of the Israelites. Why? Because before he fled from Egypt, he had killed somebody, which means that he was a murderer when he met God. But when he met God, God never talked about you, Moses. You have a murdering spirit, and so I cannot use you. God went by his past and started talking about his future he said Moses I am taking you to Egypt you are going to speak as my mouthpiece you are going to speak as my oracle I am going to make you a God over Pharaoh and a God over Aaron you see God doesn't care about your past and the mistakes of your past and the errors of your past and the iniquity and the transgressions of your past. If God cares about that, then Rahab shouldn't be in the genealogy of Jesus Christ because Rahab was a prostitute. Every man in town have slept with her. Every man in town knew her nakedness. But when he had an encounter with Jehovah, when he had an encounter with El Elyon, God never talked about her past. God never looked about her past. You check the genealogy of the savior of the world. You check the genealogy of Emmanuel. You check the genealogy of the Messiah. You check the genealogy of the king of kings. You will see Rahab, the prostitute, right there. Right there. Right there. Your past has got nothing to do with your future. That is why anytime Satan start bringing your past, you must understand that he has lost track of your future. That is the only reason why he is bringing up your past. When Satan start talking about your past mistakes and your past errors, and Satan start talking to you about the iniquity and the transgressions and the sins that you have committed in the past that you have confessed and bringing you and bringing it to your attention, it is just an indication that Satan has no clue or any idea where you are headed to. He has no clue or any idea of your destination. He has lost track of your future. Let me tell you something. There are some of you here. You are thinking about the past and the things that you have done in the past. Let me tell you.
tell you, your past is your past. Focus on the future because God is not looking at the past. God is looking at the future. Let me tell you, he will use you. He will lift you up. You will shake kingdom. You will shake nations. You will silence the words and the activities of the enemy. You have been elected. You have been selected. You have been appointed. You have been anointed by God for such a time as this to carry out God's agenda and God's divine plan. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. I receive it. Your education or lack of education doesn't disqualify you from being part of the last day's army. It doesn't disqualify you of being part of the last day's army. Because you see, if all these things disqualifies you, then God shouldn't build the last day's army according to the pattern of David. Why? Because David had so many flaws. Can I start? Yes. Are you sure I should work this? Yes. Are you sure I should work this? Yes. Somebody shout, work it, work it, work it, work it. In the first place, David was an idolater. Slept with somebody's wife. Yes, At all cost. Yes. When he knew that this is somebody's wife. Mm -hmm. Slept with her. And then ordered for the husband to come. Using manipulation. He said, bring the husband. The husband came. When the husband came. David started persuading and convincing the husband to sleep with the wife because he knew what he has done. And he was doing all these things to cover up his tracks. But the man was so committed and so loyal to David that the man refused to have pleasure when battle was going on, when war was going on. He refused to sleep with the wife. David didn't know what else to do. And so David wrote a letter and gave the letter to him and told him that this letter you have received, give it to Joab, the commander. The guy was so faithful and loyal that the guy never opened the letter to read it and didn't know that he was holding his suicide notes had no clue. Took it faithfully and gave it to Joab. And they put him at the forefront of the battle. He died. David never did anything about it. A murderer. A man who had wives and many concubines. This man had only one. One. David wanted that one. Greedy. Greedy. Convertiousness. You could have, you could have had any woman that he wanted. But he chose to have somebody's wife. At all costs. Man, the guy was bad. The guy was bad. It was evil. It was an abomination. It was detestable unto God. God, God frowned at it. Nathan the prophet shows up. And started talking to him. But he wasn't talking to him by straight words. He was talking to him through parables. Started talking to him allegorically. Said there was this man. <laughs> Referring to him. <laughs> Had many sheep. And there was this other man. Who had only one sheep. And this man that had many sheep. Took the one sheep. From the man. Before Nathan could land. 
David started releasing judgments. That man is supposed to be beheaded. That man is supposed to be killed. And Nathan was quiet. When he finished talking and landed, he said, your majesty with all respect, it is you. It is you. I'm talking about you. It's you. David said, what are you talking about? He said, remember Bathsheba? Is that your wife? You remember Uriah? You killed him. The woman's husband. Immediately he became dumb. He couldn't talk again. When he realized he was the one. Not only that. David had won every battle. And the Bible says that David had peace on every side. In other words, there was no longer battles. Everybody was afraid of David. Now David want to prove that all this battle he has won because he was a mighty man. He has won this battle because he was a military strategist. So he decided to take a census. And the Lord spoke to him through his chief commander. Joab said, don't do it, sir. He said, who are you? Keep your mouth shut and submit to authority. Joab said, yes, sir. You may carry on. David carried on. Numbered all the people. Took the census. The same day God showed up. Dispatch an angel. He said, yes. You have sinned against me. And the reason why you have sinned against me is because these battles that you have won, you didn't win it by the arm of the flesh and by the number of the people. Because I, the Lord, I went before you and I also went behind you. I fought these battles for you. That is why the other day I told you, once the Lord has spoken and twice have I heard that all power belongs to him. Why do you want to take the power that belongs to me? When you know I am a jealous God and I share not my glory with nobody. Three judgments. Pick one. Three judgments. Pick one. First, I will let you die in the hands of your enemies. You will die in the hands of your enemy. Secondly, I am bringing a dangerous, serious famine in the land. Thirdly, I will kill people, your people, the people you have numbered. I will prove to you that it is not by numbers that you had this victory. I will kill them. Choose one. And all the three wasn't good. Listen, after this program, God will give your enemies three judgments for them to choose one. And anyone that they choose, it will be for their destruction. Somebody shout fire. fire. David looked at the first one and said, no, that will be humiliating and disgraceful for me to die in the hands of my enemies. The second one, for farming to come into the land, I can't handle that. Because it is going to be in the, rock, in, in, the, in the annals, in the records, in the history books that in my time and in my day, there was farming. And I don't like that. So he chose the third one. And the Bible says that an angel appeared.
appeared within a split second 70,000 people died slayed 70,000 reduced the census and so if it has to do with the things you have done then you are not qualified because David did so many abominable things. But the great thing about these last days and the reason why is built according to the pattern of David is because when they realize they have sinned, they know how to go back to God. They know how to humble themselves. They are not caught up in arrogance. They are not caught up in pride. They know how to go on their knees. God Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. God, you can take my kingdom. You can take my crown. But don't take your spirit away from me. Because without your spirit, I am nothing. I am nothing. It is because of your spirit. That is why I am who I am. If it is because of your spirit. That is why I walk in favor. And I walk in glory. It is because of your spirit. That is why I operate in grace. You can take the gold. And take the silver. And take my armies. And take the palace. And take the crown. And take and strip me of my power. And my authority. But Jehovah. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Take it not. Take it not away from me. The man knew how to humble himself. The man knew how to cry out unto God. The man knew how to come to God and confess his sins and his transgressions and his iniquity from the depthness of his heart. He doesn't come to God in an opaque or translucent manner because there are some of us when we come to the presence of God, we talk to God and behave in his presence like he is not all knowing. So we confess the sins we want to confess and we leave the others. But when you come to God, you must be transparent. You must stand at his presence naked, 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 naked and tell God, I have come to you just as I am. I am wrong. I have done you wrong. I have hurt you. I have done contrary to your will. But cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. Father, temper judgment with mercy. With mercy. With mercy. With mercy. With mercy. God, if you forgive me, I am not returning back to it. Because I am not a dog that I should return back to my vomit. If you forgive me, I will not repeat it again. If you wash me by the blood of Jesus, I will not do it again. If you cleanse me with his soul and I become as white as snow and as white as wool, I'm not going to repeat this transgression again. God, let not your spirit depart from me. Let not your glory depart from me. God, don't cut me off from yourself because without you, I am nothing. So these last days I mean, when they sin, they know how to go to the presence of God and confess and turn from their wicked ways and start walking in the path of righteousness, the path of purity and the path of holiness. I came to announce to somebody the reason why you are stuck, the reason why you are stagnant, the reason why your destiny and your life has become static and immobile is because you have not humbled yourself in the presence of God. Your arrogance is overwhelming. Your cockiness is overwhelming. The haughty spirit that is in you will not allow you to go on your knees and ask God for forgiveness. That is why nothing is working for you. Whilst others are going forward, you are going backward. Whilst others are progressing, you are stuck at one place. If you will learn how to humble yourself, if you will learn how to go on your knees, if you will learn how to say, Father, I am sorry. Then you will move from one place to the other. One dimension to the other. One level to the other. Somebody shout, I believe, I believe, I believe. 
The last day is coming. The last day is coming. They know how to humble themselves. And when they confess, they never go back. When you look at David, every sin that he committed, he never repeated it twice after the confession. Never. Never. And you know the reason why? Because the confession was sincere. Ours is not. You are doing it because it is ritualistic tradition. You are doing it because of religiosity. But you know that immediately you finish, you are going back. You are married, you have mistress. I'm sorry, I, I just hit something you didn't like. I, I just press on a button that, that you didn't like. But I am not sorry. And the Lord spoke to you and the Lord said, stop it. So you went to his presence. He said, God, I am so sorry. But when you left, you still have her phone number. Still have the phone number. You still have her on your social media. Yeah, the ladies are responding because I'm only talking to them. What about you, the sugar daddy? You still have the number. You are testing and you are chatting. You are making video calls. You don't call your husband baby. But you are calling somebody baby. You don't call your husband honey. But you are calling your sugar daddy honey. Oh, I came to work it. When you come to his presence and you confess and you say, God, forgive me. Immediately you finish your confession. You put delete button. Boom. Out. If that is going to be a problem, thank God for blocking. Yes. Because when you delete, he may call or she may call and you will not know the number and you will pick it. You block. If you use another phone number, you block. Another phone number, block. Another phone number, block. Pretty soon, he will get it and leave you alone because it is true confession. But you, you confess and you still have the number and you tell God, God, I want to change him. Yes, that is your excuse. I want to convert him. I want him to become born again. I want, I want to make a born. You can't. Stay clear. Stay away. Cut him off. Cut her off. Because your relationship with God is valuable than anything else in the world than anything else in the world. That was how David was when he confesses. He never goes back. What God is saying to us this morning is this. If you want to be part of this last day's army, love me without reservation. And love me and me alone. You can't love me and love something else. You can't love me and still be with something. If you are with me, it got to be me alone. Me alone. God is looking for people that will have intimacy with him. God is looking for people that will have intercourse with him in his presence. God, I love you so much. I don't want to leave you. I don't want to leave you. I adore you so much. I can't do without you. When I'm in your presence, I feel the embrace of your peace. The embrace of your love. I don't want to go anywhere if I know that you are not there. You know, it's a song. I sing it most often to my wife. Have you heard it before? I don't want to go anywhere if I know you are not there. 
I'm preaching. No, I will not sing it for you. When we get home, I will sing it for my wife. <laughs> Hallelujah. The, it's tailored for her. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't want to go somewhere if I know that you are not there. In other words, wherever I go and I know it doesn't place you, I won't be there. Wherever I go and I know that you don't like it, I won't be there. Because you see, when you are in love with him, you do things that pleases him. When you are in love with him, you don't hurt him. When you are in love with him, you do things that arouses his love and affection for you. Listen to me. These last days, army, they know how to love God. They know how to love him. They know how to brag on him. That is why they won't lose any battle. They will prevail on every side. They will crush the enemy at every turn. Their voice will reverberate in the corridors of power. Because that voice that they carry is a voice and not an echo. Because it's saturated with the power of God. How much do you love him? How far are you willing to go with him? Are you willing to do anything and everything? Anything and everything. When the Lord spoke to me and said, son, I want you to focus on the church. Focus on the people that I've given to you. You travel too much. How can you be traveling around blessing other people and the flocks that I have given you, you are not feeding them. Stop it. Focus on the flocks that I've given you. Because at the end of the day, where you go, I will not require of you like the people that I've given to you. They are souls. I will require them from you. You know the first thing that came into my mind? God, if you say I shouldn't travel, how should I take care of my family? Because I don't take salary from the church. How? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to survive? How am I going to take care of my two boys and a young wife? How am I going to do all that? But suddenly, I came to myself and I said, this is God talking to me. This is God talking to me. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I would, I would do anything and everything that you want me to do. Before, every preaching engagement, as long as it's preaching engagement and I have to preach, I will accept it. But I stop. If I have to go, it has to be the Lord telling me, go. Before I go. And when I said yes, God meets all my needs. You, you don't understand. <laughs> some, some, of the some of the things, some of the things is, is even mind-boggling. It's, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. Some of the things that I think that they are trivial. Trivial things. God is not concerned about it. God provides me all those things. You won't believe it. God spoke to somebody outside of Georgia, living in out of state. And he said, God told me that I should provide you with every month. I'm going to give you a month, a month of deodorant, perfumes, you name it. And every month, she will ship it in a box every month. 
God said, son, I want to give you more. So spoke to another person in church. He said, I had a revelation. And the revelation that I had, I didn't understand. And the Lord, I asked the Lord, what does this mean? And he said, the Lord told her, I want you to supply Pastor Grant perfumes. And I'm telling you, expensive ones. Now, these are things that I'm not even thinking about, that God will be particular about all these things. But God is saying, every money I give you, I want you to keep it. These things that you are supposed to be using the money for, I am going to ask other people to be given to you so that whatever I give you, you will be able to use it to take care of your wife, your family, and pay your bills. Let me tell you, our God is a provider. He is a supplier. Supplier. He is a supplier if you will learn how to say yes to him. I told you, one of my major challenges and problems is Sunday when I'm coming to church. I don't know which suit to wear and which shoe to wear. I don't know. I can stay like an hour. My wife will tell you, and I will be looking, 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 looking. Looking, 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 looking. I will pack shoes. Okay, that this man. No, no, no. This. No, 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 no. Listen. Our God is a provider. Amen. Learn to say yes to him when he speaks to you. Just say yes. Amen. Don't even think about it. Don't. Don't try to use psychology. Don't try to use intellectualism. Don't try to analyze it. Just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. These last days, I mean, they know how to say, yes, Lord. Without even thinking about it. Rise on your feet. I want you to pray a prayer and this is the prayer. I want you to tell the Lord God from today I will say yes to you. Talk to him. Tell him from today I will say yes to you. Whatever you ask me to do I will say yes. Open your mouth and talk to him. I will say yes to you. Yes, Lord. Have your way. 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 Have your way, Lord. Have your way. Mati kibiria susu kabahayas. Re kamahan tiki biria saka. Maria kabo si kamahanta. Rokobo si kabaha teke bileas. Re kamahan tiki biria kathu kabahaya. Re kabo si kamahanta ya kabo babaya. Ra kabo liya kathu kabahan tiki biria kataya. Li kabansa kabaha teke biria. Maria kabo si kimiria kataya. Maria Kabosi Kamahanta Yakabaya. Please, somebody talk to him. Tell him, God, I will say yes to you. Yes to your will. Yes to your ways. Rekebelia su Kamahanta. Rekaba su Kabaha ti Kibirias. Li Kaba ti Kamahanta. Rokopo si kabaha te kabaha Rakamanti kibiria su kamahanta ya kabe Rokoboli ya kabe mbabanti kibiria katha Rakabo si kamahanta ya kabe babaha Rakaboli ya so kemeli ya kabanti kibiria sa kabaha Li kabahanta ya kabo babati kibiria katha Rokobo si kamahanta ya kabe babayas. Rokobo le ya kabe mbabanti kibiri ya kataya. Mali ya kabo babali ya kabe babahanti kibiri ya kataya. Marakabo si kabahaya. Abavo. 
Father, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord. I want you to lift up your hands in worship. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. Before the world began, above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Treasures of the earth. There is no way to measure what your word you were crucified, laid behind the stone. You live to die, rejected and alone.
rededicate your life to him. I want you to lift up your hands wherever you are. Just lift up your right hand and I will pray with you. Or you are saying, Pastor, I've been visiting Prayer City for a long time. I want to be part of this ministry. I want to be a member of this ministry wherever you are. Under the sound of my voice, I just want you to lift up your right hand. And I'm going to pray with you. Just lift up your right hand. And I'm going to pray with you. If your right hand is lifted, please walk up to me. Please walk up to me. I want to pray with you. Please give them a round of applause. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus. You want to be part of this ministry. Wherever you are still, the door is open. The opportunity is there for you. Forgive me of all my sins, of all my transgression. Father, I have come to you to renew my covenant with you. I have come to you to wash me thoroughly with the blood of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, to be the Savior and the king of my life from today i give my body i give my soul i give my spirit i give my heart and i give my mind to you i receive you absolutely into my heart as my lord and personal savior in jesus name amen Give Jesus a round of applause and give them a round of applause. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message. For more information about this message or the ministry, call us at 770 or visit us online at eagleschapel.com.